Hi. Cool. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, this talk is called Morphia Malware. And um, yeah, my name is uh, Sebastian. I'm uh, working as a red team operator at a company called Code White. Um, we're basically doing all sorts of uh, red teaming, purple teaming, um, also regular pen tests, but we're specialized on red and purple teaming. Um, my main part in the team is the creation of offensive tools and um, probably most importantly, the creation of a custom C2, which we're using in our assessments. And uh, this talk is uh, about the execution and the hiding of malware in the context of another process. Um, we will be taking a look at techniques which are typically used by adversaries to avoid detection either by security products or by analysts which are manually taking a look at um, processes which might be infected. And we will be trying to finger fingerprint infected processes um, simply by looking at um, the memory, um, the states of certain threads, and by taking a look at the call stack um, of certain threads. Um, I then show you, uh, or I will try to give you an idea of how to avoid being fingerprinted um, by, blending, by blending in with false positives um, or by using a bit more advanced techniques. So, two slides of um, general talk. Um, why does it actually matter? Um, for us red teams, um, protecting and hiding our tools definitely has priority for two reasons. The first reason is that we obviously do not want to get caught. If we get caught, um, then the operation is pretty much ruined. We didn't fulfill the goal. Um, the second reason is that custom tooling is quite complex and also precious. Um, those of you who are developing their own C2 know that it's a quite painful task and it might take ages uh, to, to achieve it. Um, dropping tools on disk is obviously considered an OPSEC fail. Um, operators um, tend to forget their tools on disk, which is a big problem because uh, uh, security solutions are really good at analyzing stuff that you ever put on disk. Um, but even more important, like for real operators forget what they stored on disk at some point. Um, the thing with a memory malware is that it needs a host process, otherwise it wouldn't work. Um, you cannot simply choose any process that you like, uh, notepad.exe for example, that doesn't make any sense. Why? Because uh, usually um, the process that you're injecting your tool into, um, the behavior of this process should be as similar as, um, as possible compared to the tool that you're injecting. Um, for example, it doesn't make any sense to inject a Cobalt Slug Beacon into Notepad. Why? Because Notepad usually doesn't have any internet connections, right? Um, so you will um, have to carefully choose the host process um, based on does it make any internet or internet connections? Is it making use of DP API or is it even probably known to legitimately access LSS? I personally like to target browsers because they're doing pretty much all of this. <laughs> Um, so, and the thing with process injection is that it's nowadays quite heavily monitored and this is what this talk is going to be about. So, how does it work? Um, basically, it works in three steps. Uh, the first step being that you kind of need to open a handle on the process that you're trying to inject into. Um, a handle basically allows you to perform certain operations on the process that you're trying to fiddle with. Um, the second step is then to kind of to somehow inject the payload that you're trying to execute. So, you need to write code into the context of another process. And the last step is that you somehow need to make the process into which you're injecting to actually execute the payload. Um, so, once again, first step, handle creation. Um, the most obvious way to do this is to simply make use of an API call called open process. You specify a PID, you specify a process access mask, um, and depending on if you have the right, ex the right um, permissions on the process that you're trying to access, you will be given a handle. There are a bunch of problems with this approach. Um, the first or the big problem is that um, upon process access, there's a, there's a kernel callback, meaning that um, the kernel is going to notify every single driver which is subscribing to this kernel callback about this process is actually opening another process with this access mask, um, which makes um, the creation of a new handle quite easy to observe for security products because of this kernel callback. Uh, and this is why you have the, the Sysmon event um, which is letting you know that scratchpad.exe is opening notepad.exe in this case. A probably better way would be to make use of a concept called hand duplication, and it basically works as follows. The observation is that there are multiple processes on Windows, and there might even be a process which is already holding a handle on the process that you're trying to inject into. Uh, that means that everything you need to do is you need to open the other process which already holds a handle to the process that you're trying to inject into, um, duplicate or steal this, this handle from the other process and then reuse it 
in another context. Like this, you're kind of shifting the problem away from opening the target process, but you're opening another process. Um, last year, I released a tool which is called HandleCats. Um, it leverages this exact technique to obtain a handle to Elsas, and it went pretty well by uh, bypassing a bunch of security products because there is no process access event anymore on Elsas, right? Um, there's a big problem with this approach, however, and this approach is that there is not always a suitable handle pre-existing on the system that you infected, so it's not really reliable. What is probably a bit less known is that existing handles can also be upgraded. This means that you can basically create a new handle on the target process with a very limited access mask, which doesn't show your, your real intent. And before you actually use it, you duplicate it once again. And when you duplicate it, you say, well, the duplicated version of this handle, it would be nice if it had another process, another access mask. Um, this is really cool because there's no uh, suspicious um, process access event. There's only process, uh, the duplication of a pre-existing handle with another access mask. Um, this is quite cool because there, is, there are kernel callbacks for handle duplication, but Sysmon, for example, is not um, subscribing to this uh, kernel callback. You can still observe, observe this uh, in the Windows security log, um, but the problem with this is that it must explicitly be, be configured per process and it's not enabled by default. So I really like to go with this approach in order to get a handle to another process. The thing is that obtaining a handle was only the first step, right? I showed you three steps that we need to, need to do. Um, the first step was actually not that difficult. Um, the, pro the real problem starts, we, need to, we, we now need to use our uh, newly created handle in order to inject the payload into another process. How do we do this? Um, the problem with this is that there are a bunch of um, security techniques um, trying to make your life more difficult. So, for example, you guys might have heard of a concept called user land hooks. There are even more, more kernel callbacks and there's also event tracing for Windows. Um, let, let us first talk about a bit about uh, user land hooks and system calls. This is a quite old concept and it's being widely used and exploited in the security scene, but for those of you who might have never heard of, uh, two slides of, uh, of theory. Um, the thing is that antivirus really like to redirect the execution flow of sus suspicious API calls. Um, they do so so that they understand when a certain a API call was used by a process and with which parameters it was used. Um, they do so because um, they do not really have any other chance to understand when a certain API call is used. There are not, there's not a kernel callback for every single system call there is. This used to be true. Uh, we will later get um, to how it is nowadays. And the thing is that system calls, which are usually used for process injection, are obviously hooked because the antivirus product is quite interested in why this API is actually used and how it is used. So basically, <laughs> um, basically, um, if you're making use of, if, if you're trying to um, create a remote threat, the malware is going to uh, go through the abstraction layer in the kernel 32 DLL, which is then calling um, anti something in the anti DLL, and the anti DLL is, is then going to perform the system call for you. Yeah. Um, if there's a user land hook in place, um, the first steps are similar. You still go through kernel DLL, you, you then go to anti DLL, um, and last but not least, you end up in the antivirus DLL, which is then doing some analysis for you. There are some obvious ways to bypass user land hooks, and there are, I don't know, there are a hundred thousand ways probably. Um, the most obvious way to bypass this is uh, to directly conduct a system call, and this is doable by simply embedding the code uh, snippets of the anti DLL into your own malware, and then um, doing, letting your malware actually do the, uh, the system call for you, which directly, which effectively bypasses kernel 32, anti DLL, and the other antivirus DLL. However, I mean, it does bypass user land hooks, but there are some very obvious problems with this approach. Um, the obvious problem is that all system calls should go through NTDLL. If any other module than NTDLL is doing a system call, then this is quite suspicious because this should actually never be the case. And if you take a look at Sysmon, um, in the first, in the upper screenshot, we see the usage of the Windows API and we see that the last module in the call trace is actually NTDLL. But if we make use of direct system calls, uh, here I use the tool by, by Outflank. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, we see that the last module in the call trace um, is actually not NTDLL, but it's Outflank Dumper DLL, which is a big indicator of compromise, I'm assuming. Um, 
The problem, however, is that yes, you can sometimes observe direct system calls using Sysmon, but there are not kernel callbacks for every single system call there is. There's one for anti-open process, but there are way more um, system calls you guys might be interested in. Um, and since there is no kernel callback for every single system call, uh, you might want to use an additional framework. Um, and an additional framework which you might be leveraging is called Novana, uh, which is an instrumentation engine used by Microsoft. It's present uh, in Windows since Vista. It's a quite complicated thing, and I'm not going to get into too many details here, but it can actually be used to monitor and control user met processes without recompiling the target. Um, more importantly, it even allows us to define callbacks for system calls upon return from kernel mode. And what that means is that we can basically specify if a, uh, if a system call returns from kernel mode, um, it should, before it continues the execution in user mode, um, it should execute our user-specified callback. And this actually allows us to hook basically every single system call um, and perform some additional code before it transitions back to user mode. More importantly, it allows us to check where the system call is returning in user mode. If it's not returning to somewhere in NTDLL, then this is obviously an IOC. And there's a really cool sample implementation by Winternal. And if we make use of um, this implementation uh, again against uh, Outflank Dumpert, um, the implementation by Winternal, I, I think it's called Syscall Detect, is immediately complaining that uh, the kernel returns to an unverified module and it's going to, uh, to exit. So this can actually potentially be used by security products in order to identify direct system calls. Uh, it's just that the performance overhead might actually be a, a big issue here. Um, so, okay, so what can we do against this? Um, obviously, we need to make sure that our system calls go through NTDLL and bypass user land hooks at the same time. And the cool observation is um, that an antivirus product does, of course, not hook every single system call there is, otherwise it would also run into performance problems. Um, it only hooks so those system calls it's actually interested in. Um, this leaves us to the observation, or this brings us to the observation that some system call stops are simply not hooked because the API calls are simply not interesting enough. Um, yet, all system call stops do pretty much the same thing, but they use a different system call number. So basically, they move the system call number to EAX and then perform the system call by syscall red. Uh, what can we do? Um, the idea could be to first resolve the system call number um, by using a technique called Halo Skate, uh, which is by uh, Sector 7. And then we initialize the system call manually, and then we reuse uh, existing syscall red instructions from a clean system call stop in order to perform the system call. So we basically jump um, to a very certain location of a clean system call stop, which is the system call red instruction. We basically reuse these instructions um, from a clean system call stop. So, uh, I'm a paint master. Um, we first set up the registers, um, then we kind of reuse the stop once again, meaning that we choose a clean system call stop which is not hooked, and then reuse the system call red instructions from there, which effectively bypasses the user land hooks, and we're going through NTDLA at the same time. Um, I wrote a small implementation for this. You can find it on my GitHub. And if I make use of this <coughs> and I, let, uh, I use the syscall detect tool at the same time, it's not complaining. Why is it not complaining? Because the system calls, they all return to NTDLL. Um, and you see on, uh, in Sysmon, the last module on the call stack is NTDLL. There are still some IOCs though, um, because usually system calls go through kernel-based DLL and then to NTDLL. This is the first IOC. <coughs> the second IOC is that, yeah, the system call returns to NTDLL, but it does not return to the correct stub, which is associated with the executed system call. And by leveraging hooking Nirvana, this might be an, an idea in order to leverage this. Cool. So user land hooks are still a thing in 2022, actually, and I was quite surprised about this um, because I thought it's like a relict from the past, but that's not the case. Many antivirus uh, security products still rely heavily on them, and the question is why. Um, the first reason is that monitoring from kernel only can cause stability issues, because uh, if you fuck up your kernel driver, then your client uh, won't be protected, but have a, has a blue screen. Um, and the second problem was, this is not the case anymore, but it was that um, missing telemetry, because there was no other, no, no other way for an antivirus to understand if and how a certain API call was used. So it was used kind of a patch to, under, to, get, to get more telemetry. 
what matters from the attacker's perspective is basically that user and hooks are not a problem. They can always be efficiently and stealthily bypassed, and GitHub is full of user and hook bypassing techniques. Cool, so now we should be able to conduct memory operations on the remote process with the handle we gained earlier in a very stealth way. So we should be able to inject our payload using every single API core we want. Is that true? And the thing is, we still need to keep some, mind, some, some facts in mind, because some system calls trigger a kernel callback, as I was saying before, and others can actually be, be observed by ETW, because there's a ETW provider which many um, security solutions have begun subscribing on, and it's called the Microsoft Windows Threat Intelligence uh, ETW provider. The provider sits in kernel, so there's not a, a lot you can do against this from user mode. And for us, it's kind of a problem because um, it delivers uh, events for everything that might be used for process injection, you know, APCs, uh, suspending threats, resuming threats, and so on and so on. Um, so it should in provide enough telemetry in order to observe typical process injection techniques, and there are a bunch of device event action types you can use. Um, I tried to write rules for this uh, for, for a client, for a very big client in a purple teaming assessment. And yeah, you can see the process injection. It's just that these API calls are often are so often used in a legitimate context that it's almost impossible to write a working detection rule for this without having any false positives. So what actually matters in my, in my opinion is which process in injects into which other process, and more importantly, what is actually being injected. If you inject a plain cobalt stock beacon into another process in the most stealth way, it will still be it will still be picked up simply because it's cobalt stock. So our next problem is actually static signatures, and we need to think about how to avoid static signatures or evade static signatures. Um, okay, once again, we successfully injected our payload into the target process, and obviously now uh, Yara rules are applied by security products in order to identify if it is something they already know. And there are multiple ways to bypass this. Some are better than others, but let us take a look at this. Um, the first concept is called uh, polymorphism. Uh, it's a very old concept. What you're doing is basically you encrypt your payload and you glue it together with a decryption stub. Uh, the decryption stub decrypts the payload and then actually executes it. Cool. Um, so here we have a hello world.bin, which basically pops up a message box. And we remember uh, it starts with ASCII uh, VH something something. If we, if we put it into executable memory, uh, it pops a message box and we see the VH something something in the executable memory page. Cool. Um, now, if we make use of Shikata Ganai, which is a polymorph encoder, uh, we see that, yeah, it looks really different. It doesn't start with VH and there's no VH something something anymore because it's encrypted. Um, but what happens if we ex actually execute it in memory? We see that the first bytes are different, but at some point, uh, our VH something something pops up once again. And we, w we wanted to avoid this, wasn't it? Um, so, there are a bunch of problems with polymorphism. Um, first, it needs RWX, which is an indicator as such. Second thing, the decryption stub as such can be fingerprinted. And after decryption, the, your malware or your tool or whatever is not protected in plain memory. So, it might help to bypass the initial memory scan, but uh, at some point if the memory scan happens like, I don't know, 20 minutes later, your cobalt stop beacon or whatever is going to be plain in memory. Kubitz like makes use of a, or tackles this problem with a concept called sleep mask. It was introduced in version four, the three is wrong, it's four or something. Um, and the core idea is actually quite simple. Um, the observation is that a beacon basically spends most of the time sleeping and waiting for new commands. So what you can do is, while sleeping, sleeping the beacon actually obfuscates and encrypts itself in memory while it is sleeping. And you must be quite unlucky if um, the memory scanner hits you right in the, in the situation where your beacon is active, because usually a beacon is active only for, I don't know, a fraction of a second or something like that. There are some limitations with this, however, because the first limitation might be that the sleep mask itself can be fingerprinted. You can customize this in Cobalt Stock. And we also have other memory artifacts, which we will, which we will take a look at later. I, however, like to use another concept and the idea is to change the appearance of a program on instruction level. If we change the appearance of a program on instruction level, uh, we do not need any encoding or encryption or whatever, and we do also not need any RWX because we're not encrypting anything. Um, there are multiple ways to achieve this. Um, one way to achieve this is to substitute instructions with a sequence of instructions which lead to the same result, yet these are other instructions. What you, what you could also be doing is add uh, useless instructions or add trash and jump over the trash or you shuffle the basic blocks or whatever. The 
terminology for this is quite unclear for me. If you Google this, some actually call it a variant of polymorphism, other call it metamorphism. In this talk, we call it keyless polymorphism. <laughs> um, so some ideas for substitutions. If you want to null out a register, either you can write XOR i x i x, or you move a zero to i x, or you store another register on the stack, null out this register, move this register to i x, and then restore this register. If you want to jump to RCX, you could also write push RCX and then return, where push RCX could also be written like this. So there are a bunch of ideas uh, or instructions which can be substituted with an equivalent of other instructions. Um, by adding trash, as I said, um, basically you add complete trash bytes or instructions which don't make any sense at all, and you add a jump over the trash. And however you do it, in the end of the day, um, so on the left side we see our um, actual program, um, which is not obfuscated or whatever, and on the right side we see that the first instruction mm, was substituted with another instruction, the second one is also substituted, then we have a jump over the trash, then probably an instruction which could not be substituted, and last but not least, another substitution. Um, I really like to leverage this technique to protect my tools from automated memory scanners, and it's quite powerful if enough instructions are substituted. You obviously need the source code for this, because otherwise you would be breaking uh, relative gems. Um, and if you consider this to be a problem, it makes your payload obviously significantly larger. Um, also, you need to take into consideration that strings and constants need to be encrypted and obfuscated additionally, because this is not part of the polymorph uh, process. Um, doing this by hand is really, really annoying, and you should automate this. Uh, I'll get le I will later get back to how to automate this. Cool. So once again, we remember our VH something something shellcode. It pops a message box. Um, and here, if we use this keyless polymorph concept, we see that it actually doesn't start with VH anymore. Actually, you don't find these constants anymore in an executable mem memory page, um, yet the message box still pops up. If there's someone really uh, careful, uh, you see that this is actually in an RWX page. I earlier said if you don't need RWX, it's because I forgot to change the page permissions. Um, cool, so now we gained a handle in a very stealthy way. Uh, we defended user length hooks while still we go uh, through NTDLL and we defeated scanners using some kind of polymorphism. The problem now is that infected processes leave a lot of other IOCs. So even if you manage to infect a process that you wanted to infect, you still have a lot of other IOCs. Let us take a look at, look at suspicious artifacts. Um, to understand this, some, uh, some basics. Windows roughly has three types of memory. There's private committed memory, which is reserved for heap and stack. There's map memory, which is used for file mapping and IPC. And there's also image committed memory, which is basically used by uh, PE files and executable, executables. And the thing is that usually only um, image committed memory should be marked as executable. Um, there are some false positives or there are some, some exceptions, for example, managed code uh, like C sharp, uh, because it's uh, bytecode, which is compiled. Uh, interpreted uh, at, uh, at runtime, but as we see on the screenshot, actually only, or normally only, uh, image committed memory should be marked as executable. And this gives us a big problem because we somehow we need to gain executable memory uh, while injecting into a remote process. And the problem is how do we actually get re executable memory in a remote process? And there are a bunch of memory scanners which are really, really good at um, finding memories or abnormal memory allocations. Um, the one by Moneta is uh, really popular, and they're really good at detecting abnormal memory allocations. So for example, if you make use of virtual alloc or anti-map view of section or whatever, um, Moneta is quickly complaining about, hey, there are two uh, pages which are marked as executable, yet they are marked as private commit. What the fuck is this? That doesn't make any sense. The next, uh, next try could be to make use of DLL hollowing, where we load an unused DLL into the remote process, and then replace the text segment um, with our own code. Problem, uh, Monita is complaining again. Why? For two reasons. First, Monita is asking, why did this uh, process load this DLL? It's not declared in the PEB or anywhere. Why did it decide to load this DLL? Second problem, um, the text segment of the DLL on disk is not the same as the text segment of the DLL in memory. It's also a big problem for Moneta. And there are a bunch of ways to bypass memory scanners, um, and they basically all boil down to um, changing the page permission of the beacon uh, while it's actually sleeping. Um, 
because memory scanners only check for executable memory regions in order to find known bad. Um, this leaves us, this brings us a big problem because how do you mark your own code as not executable while you're executing? This should not actually happen. This not, should not work. Uh, but it does work with a bit of black magic and I like to leverage a concept used by exploit coders which is called return oriented programming. Um, which leverages uh, stack pivoting and existing small code snippets um, from any NTDLL or other executable memory which is there legitimately. So the idea is before the beacon goes to sleep, uh, we set up a ROP chain which first calls virtual protect, uh, marking our beacon as not executable, then it drops itself to sleep and then it drops itself again to page execute read. Um, this is nothing new as such. Um, the original idea was called Gargoyle. I, I'm assuming it was uh, first implemented by F-Secure, but I'm not sure about this. Um, and the core idea here is that before we go to sleep, we set up the stack and we set up the stack as follows. Um, the first return address on the stack points to a gadget which uh, sets up the registers um, or which, pop, which pops the other values on the stack uh, in a certain way and in such a way that on the next return, when virtual protect happens, um, the address of the beacon is not marked or the page of the beacon is not marked as executable anymore. So, upon the next return, our beacon looks like this. It's not executable anymore, and the stack looks like this. And now, the first gadget on the stack points to a pop RCX uh, gadget, which effectively puts the 5000 on the stack um, to RCX, which is the first parameter for sleep, and then it pops the return address of sleep and goes to sleep for 5000 milliseconds. Now, the beacon is not executable, and it's sleeping at the same time. And when the beacon returns, obviously, it takes the first return address from the stack, again, um, setting up the registers for uh, virtual protect, which then, upon returning, uh, makes our beacon resuming. Um, I released a small proof of concept for this, which I call Deep Sleep. It's also on my GitHub. Um, while it is active, it's actually popping a message box and monitor complaints. Why? Because there is private executable memory or something. Um, but while sleeping, we see that the page of uh, Deep Sleep is actually marked as not available or execute uh, read only. Yeah. Read only makes sense. Um, so we bypass memory scanners looking for executable memory. There are a bunch of other implementations. Um, they all boil down once again to the, to the same idea, which is changing the page permissions while sleeping. Um, there's one by uh, Cracked Spider, there's one by Sec Idiot called Foliage. Um, yeah, but they are all pretty much boiled down to the same idea. Now, the question is actually, this was quite complicated, and the question is, is that actually necessary? And I would say no, because if you run Moneta on Firefox, for example, you see a bunch of false positives once again. So you also see in Firefox there's, that there is a bunch of private and executable memory, and it even modified its own, its own DLA, uh, its own anti-DLA. So, I believe that memory artifacts alone are a quite good first indicator, um, but they have way, way too many false positives. Um, for example, why did Firefox change its own anti-DLL? It's because it likes to hook its own create thread as a matter of an anti-exploit me mechanism. Memory scanners can also be uh, bypassed using Gargoyle-like techniques, and so the problem is that we definitely need more, need more metrics in order to identify infected processes. Once again, the um, observation is that beacons spend most of the time waiting for new commands. And what developers really like to do um, to make the beacon sleep is to simply call sleep. This is really obvious, right? Um, but there's a big problem with sleep. And the problem with this um, API call is that it sets this threat which is calling sleep to a very special state. It's called, anti, uh, it's called delay execution. And on my machine, I had 1,500 threads. Out of these 1,500 threads, and only 20 were in the state delay execution. So we boiled down from 1,500 to 20 threads, which might be a beacon. 20 are still too many to check, so we need another metric. The net, next metric could be a call stack. On the left side, we see a normal call stack. We see that it, that it starts somewhere in a user thread start, and it can map every return address on the stack to a um, to a module on disk. On the right side, we see the one of a cobalt strike beacon, and we see that it does not start where it's supposed to start, and at the same time, there is this uh, hex 1a. What is this? This cannot be associated with a file on disk, so this, this is quite abnormal. 
And if you take a look at the implementation of Gargoyle, also of the deep sleep thing, um, the call stack looks even more broken because there are a bunch of pointers which cannot be mapped to a file on disk. And it looks like virtual protect is calling sleep. If you show me a developer who does this legitimately, I want to talk to him. Um, so yeah, call stacks are also a thing. And now the question is, out of the 1,500 threads I have on my machine, how many of these are in delay execution and have a stack trace to delay execution which contains unknown or tempered regions? The answer is only one and it's a beacon. So also for this I created a small tool to automate these steps, it's called uh, Hans Sleeping Beacons and it first enumerates um, threads which are in delay execution and then it checks the call stack um, for unknown regions and also for um, text segments which do differ um, compared from the um, in memory compared to the uh, version on disk. Um, yeah, it picks up deep sleep because um, this, the thread is, called, is in delay execution and the stack is really, really broken. I had some false positives with this approach. Um, I had posit false positives with updaters which are trying to protect itself because they're actually behaving like a beacon. You know, they're also trying to obfuscate themselves in memory because you don't, they don't want you to reverse it. At the same time, they're also sleeping between their intervals. Um, and I also had some false positives with very crappy C-sharp applications. There are some other very easy bypasses for unsleeping beacons. The first idea could be to simply spoof the call stack, which is actually not very easy if you want to do it correctly. Um, but the more easy way would even be to simply don't use sleep to wait between your callbacks. You can also make use of rateable timers in order to have a bit of delay. Uh, this then sets the thread in a state called wait user request, which is way more common than delay execution. Cool. So call stacks definitely leave significant IOCs, and this does not only apply to end delay execution, but it also applies to other system calls. Uh, memory scanners can actually fully be bypassed using gargoyle or gargoyle-like techniques, and C, code, C, C2 coders should definitely avoid uh, using sleep. Internally for my C2, I use a modified version of Deep Sleep, uh, which is using rateable timers. Cool. Um, this is almost the end of my presentation. Um, I have some tools to release. Uh, we was, um, earlier we were talking about keyless polymorphism. Um, I created a tool to automate the step, which I call Spider Pick. <laughs> um, and it actually um, does the obfusc obfuscation on assembly level. So what you do is, um, you first compile it using GCC or whatever to, um, and you make the compiler output assembly, then you make uh, that spider pick do its job, it's doing the obfuscation, and then you compile it just as normal. And in order to uh, show how greatly this actually works, uh, we're also releasing a SOX proxy, which is implemented as position independent code. The client makes use of WebSockets and is implemented as pick. And the spider pick is integrated into Makefile. So it looks differently every single time you compile um, the, uh, the client version. The back end is written by my colleague and good friend Christian. Um, and yeah, you can find it on our GitHub. So if every time you compile Lastenzug, you see that the fuzzy hash is completely different, um, yet they are all the same program. You can find it here on our GitHub. I think my boss clicked on release right now. And you simply type make <laughs> to build it. <laughs> okay, that's it.